mute it. Good evening. Welcome to the Hack42 Church. Yes, we has. Um, welcome to the first lecture in a long series of lectures. Uh, we are BI 4.2. And uh, th this Tech Campus initiative, I'll explain very briefly what it is and then explain what we're going to do now. Um, we thought of a project and a awesome hacker project uh, called Beehive. And the story till now, um, we've been lobbying. We've been lobbying our ass off. Because what we want to do is we buy this piece of property. It's an actual panopticon that used to be a prison. and. That's the one we want. And what we want to do there is build something not unlike the hacker camps, uh, like, well, you, you can read what the heck, uh, hackers at large, Om, Shah, all the things. But if you combine all these open air hacker camps, not, well, they're not all open air, but if you combine all these hacker camps and look at how many effectively how many days that are, that's only five days in a year, and that's about 2%. That's not effective. So that's why we want a full-time, 24-7, live in, living in a hacker space, a hacker compound, where you can actually rent a room and do your stuff. It's a nice building with a character, and it's huge. It has, absolutely, we've been there. And it's, it's fucking awesome and very huge. It has quite a lot of rooms and uh, we're trying to fill those up with cool stuff and also with some, some companies because so, somebody has to foot the bill. Well, who is we? We is this, me, I'm Jos Weijers. Arjen, where are you? There's Arjen Kamphuis. We have Bart van Hoven. Is Bart here? Duig. <laughs> Martijn van Beelen, Martijn, where are you? Martijn, daar. And Hilke Jan. Of course, he's in the back, he's always in the back. There's Hilke Jan. <coughs> so, and of course, that gang of five, we of course need adult supervision. Because we have ideas, but that's about it. We are looking for a uh, advisory board, and we found three people so far that we think are f uh, fit that bill perfectly. And we're looking at a couple more, but to give you an idea of what we have now, this guy, Bart. Bart, Bart, where are you? I see you need. There, Bart Jacobs. Thank you. Bart will keep us in check. We have Ancilla van der Leest, because we want to be in check. Thank you. And um, she's very, well, into the hacking thing and, of course, uh, freedom of information stuff and all that. And we have uh, J.L. Blue. So, uh, CISO from KPN and... Uh, awesome person. There will be more, that list will be longer, and uh, what we need to do uh, is get that building. There are more parties that want that building, so we want to create a buzz and explain the idea we're going to do and, and tell everybody that it's awesome, so please do tweet your hell off. There, we're in a church, there is Wi-Fi, do we have passcodes? It's Beehive Beehive, I think. So there is a, there, there is Wi-Fi. Yes, I, I see nodding heads. So Beehive is the password and Beehive is also the account to uh, make use of the Wi-Fi here and um, spread the word. That's basically it. Um, and to create the buzz and to give a little preview of the stuff that we want to do once we have the actual property, we organized this little lecture and that Arjen is going to talk, introduce us a bit more about. So good evening all, thanks for coming out here when you could be uh, getting drunk somewhere else. Um, <coughs> uh, I've uh, been uh, working with uh, intelligence whistleblowers mainly and also some actual intelligence people who are still for uh, a couple of years working on information security and sort of the sharp end of the business. Um, it's been a lot of fun, sometimes a little bit scary. Uh, um, and uh, over the last week I've had as my guests uh, Bill Binney, who is a former NSA uh, uh, senior technologist, he will uh, speak uh, much more about what we're, what we're going to do. And we've had him over over the last week basically to, to meet a lot of people who know a lot less about many of these things than most of the people here, and to basically scare the crap out of them. 
Uh, we did that last Monday and Tuesday on the uh, national CIO conference where apparently most of the CIOs heard all this stuff for the first time, which that was the most shocking bit to me. They were all shocked about what Bill had to tell. I was completely shocked by the fact that they were shocked. So it was a shocking day altogether. Um, uh, uh, but, but, but we woke a bunch of people up and they will now be asking slightly more the right questions about sort of maybe we shouldn't all run our entire nation state on Amazon cloud services in the future, especially hospitals and banks. Uh, so uh, it's been it's been really good. We're going to do more of this in the future, um, and uh, uh, all the information you're about to see, all the slides that you may not be able to read at the end of the, this evening, everything will be online, plus various other interesting documents that Bill has provided me with. You can also have copies of those, and Bill will explain that you can actually do some cool stuff with that. Um, so this is very roughly, very roughly. Uh, the program. We're going to have a break at some point, uh, and then there will be questions after, but for the first section, I would ask everybody to just uh, listen to what uh, Bill has, uh, has to say to us. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Bill. Hey, good evening. Yes. Uh, well, first, I'd like to go through some of the slides that we discussed with the CIOs earlier in the week, and uh, most of it, I think you'll probably be aware of some of it, at least uh, hopefully there'll be some new here. Uh, and then I like to go into some uh, some ways they should be doing analysis but aren't, uh, specifically against mass data or bulk data or big data, as people call it. Um, <clears throat> I, I've been only been doing this for about 50 years, so I have some experience in the analog days, which were relatively smaller big data, but still big data. And the, the same techniques I, I used back there, I used uh, on uh, on the uh, digital age. So it's no. It's not really different. It's the same. <coughs> Oops. Am I hitting that button? I guess I am. OK, there we are. So uh, I, I didn't mean to get ahead of myself there, but my finger was hitting it accidentally. So at any rate, <coughs> the idea of uh, mass data. Here, here is the, uh, here's the set of programs I left NSA uh, in 2001. And uh, these are the ones they're still using today. This material, by the way, is all from Edward Snowden and when he released it, so I had the opportunity now to talk about it publicly. So, <laughs> so now it's all in the, uh, in the, uh, sorry? Emma, it's, that's not the right one, where, where is, it? is there a pointer there? It's not bright enough. Well, okay, but anyway, let me, I'll explain it. Down the, down the right-hand side, within the box there are all the NSA programs. Uh, this is basically the concept I left with NSA and how we were operating in the SIGIN Automation Research Center. Uh, the Marina and Mainway programs are basically how you index data using the metadata components for phones, phone numbers, uh, IP numbers, uh, bank account numbers, uh, uh, passport numbers, any kind of, any kind of attribute that uh, would describe you anywhere in any electronic uh, media. We would use that to map and graph and build social networks for everybody on the planet. And uh, <clears throat> that uh, then would index down into the, uh, for the uh, digital world in, in the uh, internet, it would be in the pinwheel database. For a voice, it would be in, in the nucleon. <clears throat> that was the content of what was being said. And this is uh, where uh, the uh, metadata was indexed down to the content so that when you went into the metadata and pulled that information out and said, give me everything relative to that, it would pull all the content with it too, and you could build a timeline on anybody that you were looking at, including everybody they had associations with. So, uh, <clears throat> And uh, one of the most important things here is you look on the uh, right or left-hand side there at the bottom is FBI and CIA. <clears throat> this is basically telling you that the FBI goes through the DI DTU, the FBI DTU, that's really the Quantico Technology Center for the FBI. And so they're going directly into the NSA databases and pulling and looking at information on everybody in the world and then uh, using it to look for criminal activity. So I call this the marrying of uh, secret intelligence agencies like the NSA, CIA, with the policing organizations, the FBI, and the, also the Drug Enforcement Administration has access to. So this is uh, marrying uh, the secret intelligence agencies with the police, so you have a secret police which in many countries were called the Gestapo or other kinds of uh, uh, secret intelligence and secret police kind of operations. But uh, <clears throat> this fundamentally is done outside of our constitution and it's all unconstitutional really. 
and they're using this to arrest people, and then they do a parallel construction to manufacture evidence to substitute for the NSA data that they used to originally arrest them in a court of law because it's not admissible there. Uh, <clears throat> and so they do this parallel construction and then perjure themselves in court. And they also share this through the MLAT procedure worldwide with other uh, policing organizations who are affiliated with them and anywhere in the world. So if any of your police organizations here in the Netherlands have relationships with the FBI or the DEA, then they're getting data through this system. So you're corrupting your entire uh, judicial process, not just in the U.S., but around the world. Uh, and these are the programs I left them with. And this is just uh, for the prison program. This is was displayed, but those are the same programs for every input that they have. So you can just change it to upstream or any other program of collecting data, and that goes into these programs. Uh, <clears throat> for the cable system, these, they have these three ways of tacking the cables. Uh, uh, first, they try to get cooperation from the, from the telecommunications companies or <clears throat> those people running the fiber networks because then they get them to manage the tapping system that they install and uh, they, take the, they get them to uh, take care of it and they of course pay them to do that. So that means that they, they are uh, actually hiring these companies to work for them uh, directly. And so these companies then uh, manage all the uh, tap points and so that's where they get all the feeds that are sending all this data back, to, and it's, the, it's everything on the fiber network. It's everything that's taken in. There's no dark fiber. Anything coming across uh, the fiber gets sessionized and reconstructed and stored in databases at uh, NSA and various other places like in Utah, the Bluffdale facility. It's a million square foot uh, storage facility that they put in, uh, that came online in 2013, and they're now preparing to replace that one with a 2.8 <clears throat> million square foot facility, almost three times the size. Uh, that they broke ground for last summer, uh, which means it'll be online in about four four years or so, and at that time, Bluffdale probably will be full of data, so they'll have a new place to put the data. Uh, and it, it's uh, their their objective is to collect everything, so what that means is it's an ever-increasing amount of data year after year, so that means they have to keep building ever-increasing sized data centers to store it, uh, and that's fundamentally what they're doing. <clears throat> So uh, if the corporations don't want to cooperate, uh, then they go to the local governments or the agencies, like parallel agencies like B&D or others, uh, the intelligence agencies, and they get them to sponsor them uh, within that country. <clears throat> and uh, then they, <clears throat> through that agency, they manage the collection and forwarding of data to back to the central storage back at NSA. So, and so NSA is becoming a storage facility, not just for uh, the United States, but also for the Five Eyes and all other countries that are cooperating with them. Because as a part of the cooperation, they share some of the information, which means they give them programs like X Key Score or IC Reach to use to interrogate the database. So they also have that ability. <clears throat> Any country participating with them has that kind of ability to interrogate that database. Now, what? What they share of that is based on the agreements made between each individual country and the U.S. or the Five Eyes group. So that, that's, how, that's how that operates, and it varies country to country according to the areas of interest and access and contribution, really. So, <clears throat> but um, ultimately, if the governments, uh, foreign governments and their agencies don't want to cooperate, that doesn't matter either. If they can get to the fiber, they'll tap it unilaterally which simply means they can, they can tap any fiber as long as they can physically get to it. So that's how that works, and that's really the, uh, they have hundreds of taps, and uh, I gave Arian uh, copies of uh, hundreds of tapping points, including the street addresses and buildings, and you can look it up on Google Maps and find, uh, find all of the attributes of them, like they've got uh, parabolics on the, on the roof to look for, uh, to tap into the satellites, and. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that's how I hit that, okay. So, and also uh, ca cabling, see, the, they have to be near railroads because the railroads uh, have, basically it's the shortest distance between major cities, usually is along the railroad, and, and they have right away already, so it's easy and they don't have to tear up anything or it's not that difficult to lay fibers along there. So it makes it easy to install fibers and connect the uh, major cities and uh, 
So <clears throat> that makes it cheaper for them. So I look for railroads and, and also large cooling units on the roof of the building because that tells you there's something very hot happening in the building. Usually it's the uh, data centers and so on. So, uh, and a lot of them are advertised by them on Google. I use Google to look at this. So that's how I pulled all these locations together. Uh, so it's out there on the web. You can look at them too. So that's, uh, and uh, he's got all those and you can look at some of those and some are, um, a part of the unilateral tapping points, but uh, <clears throat> some of the, the unilateral points are, you know, underwater and underground and things like that, as long as you can get into them through the sewer system or whatever, you can get to that. So, so that's, that's fundamentally the basic uh, ways they are tapping. Um, <clears throat> and these are all the companies that they're involved with. Originally, uh, <clears throat> Uh, I had estimated the numbers of companies participating with NSA in terms of the bulk data transfer was about 78 companies. That was based on that first order that was given. It, was, it went to Verizon. Uh, that was the first thing published from the Snowden material in 6th of June of 2013. Um, and uh, it, it was the serial number, and I based it all on a serial number, it was BR13-80. That meant business records warrant order by the FISA court to the, to the company. Uh, and it was 2013, and it was order number 80. And that was issued to Verizon on the second quarter of 2013. Well, if you know, <coughs> the uh, telecommunications companies uh, were the first ones in line to do this bulk transfer. The first one I knew of was AT&T. Then the second largest one is Verizon. So that was that, they should have gotten order number one and two of quarter one. Well, that meant that Verizon being order two in quarter one and order 80 in quarter two, that meant there were 78 companies in between. That's how I calculate it. And this slide said there was 80, so they've added two since then. So since they added, made up this slide. But, but these are some of the, some of the things that, uh, and they don't list uh, things like banks and so on. So we have banking institutions for the credit card transfers and all of that here too, and travel and things like that. So, <clears throat> These are the kinds of things that, and that means basically that they're using these companies also to penetrate all these devices. So they're penetrating actually millions of devices. That's why in the British U UK, the investigative powers bill has a bulk attack, uh, device attack uh, authorization within it, which means that they can uh, attack, um, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of, of devices around the world in mass. That's one of the reasons they uh, they want weaknesses in all these systems. If these these uh, devices have these weaknesses built in, they can attack them anywhere in the world remotely. So that makes it easier to collect data off them too. Uh, then these are the countries that are participating. Uh, uh, first party is the U.S. Second party are the other uh, uh, English-speaking countries, and third parties are the l others listed here. I think there's 33 of those. Uh, and fourth party, which isn't listed, is, is a list of countries that we have relationships with that we don't want anybody at all to know about. <laughs> that is because that uh, <clears throat> probably, you know, some of the countries we wouldn't even want to be associated with in any direct way, publicly anyway, so. Uh, then, of course, these are the access points they're using, uh, and it's worldwide. Um, I specifically would point out the little yellow dots there that's CNE, that's Computer Network Exploitation. And it says there, I know you probably can't read it, it says there are over 50,000 implants in, in devices around the world. This is a, a dated slide, there's many more than that now, but uh, it gives you the idea of the extent of the penetration of the network. This is, what that means is they've implanted hardware and or software in switches and servers and computers around the world. Uh, which means <clears throat> which means they own those devices and can make them do what they want, like route duplicate copies of things uh, any or route anything passing through the switch, also a co send a copy to NSA. So the, this is the level of penetration uh, of the network. Uh, and you notice that the, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and the Canada, the US, and really Great Britain are kind of blank internally. Uh, that's not true either, because this slide doesn't show all of the internal taps on the 
Five Eyes countries tapping their own citizens. Uh, in the U.S., there are over 100 or just about 100 taps internally in the US, United States, the lower 48 states. That's because we, we were the first main target of bulk acquisition. So, I mean, we were close, you know, easy to get to. So that made us the easy targets first. So we, we were first in the pit, and then everybody else in the planet came along afterward. So at any rate, uh, then <clears throat> the whole objective of that is to uh, map every device uh, in the network where it is every minute of every day. And they look at first the uh, physical layout of the world and then map to that the, uh, the, the physical network. That means the layout of fibers, microwaves, satellite, uh, and all the interconnections between them. They lay that as a, as a map over, over the geography. And then they see the devices with the attributes, IP numbers, MAC numbers, uh, phone numbers, all of those kind of attributes that are used to connect data through and communicate between people in the network. Uh, and then they map those back to the devices, back to the people, and they want to know where everybody is every minute of the day. Now, they could use that kind of data very simply by saying, okay, here are 50 locations for a given person, and of those 50, I maybe have uh, five or eight where I have video of people in that area, plus or minus a foot. Uh, and so then you can simply take the video and say, what what uh, what face is in common, and they now have your face, and they can follow you video-wise too. So you can map that, and that can be done automatically with software. But that's the objective, and then they map, of course, all the data to that, so they then know where you are, and uh, basically give the content of some of the things you're doing, buying things, selling things, talking to people, whatever, what, seeing your community, following you everywhere you go, basically. So <clears throat> this is big data, and, and it really, uh, what they're doing from the acquisition system is collecting so much data they can't figure anything out. It means they're really good at collecting data, but they're really bad at figuring out what they've got. And this is really pretty evident if you see how many terrorist attacks have they really stopped in the U.S., Europe, or anywhere else in the world. The answer is none, really. I mean, they're good at entrapping people, but stopping people who really have an intent to do something, they're really bad at. Why? Because to entrap someone, they can go directly to them and deal directly with them and say, uh, try to entice them into saying, yes, we'll do an attack, you know, or something like that. That's easy. But finding them in the data they're collecting means they have to look through all of the data that they're looking at to try to find somebody who's intending to do an attack. Well, this is where they're really bad, and they, and they end up by doing this because they really think, and if you listen to them and what they, the way they say these kinds of things, they think data and is intelligence. And it's not. I mean, it is data, but, but, and you need that to figure out what is, what is, and understand, if you understand what is in the data, you can then derive and, and, uh, and uh, report things like intelligence and of intentions and capabilities of, of uh, uh, targets and groups of people, but unless you understand it, you can't. So, but they're confusing intelligence with data. And, the, and if you, I mean, I know these people, right? They're, they're, most of them are pretty dense. Certainly the managers are. <laughs> so, anyway, that's a knock on managers. But anyway, uh, the idea is they're confused and they, and they think they're doing the right thing and, and they're doing actually the wrong thing, but they're doing it for their agenda, and their agenda is to build a big empire, manage a lot of money, and in order to do mass and bulk acquisition of data, that takes a lot of money. And really, that's what they're after. And that takes a lot of, I mean, they're, it's, they're probably going to spend 4 to $5 billion on this one storage center, the 2.8 million square foot one, in the next four years just to hold all the data they're going to collect. Uh, that doesn't count all the contracts that have to go out for, for, for contractors to, do, to manage the data, to build in query routines, to, to ensure that the data is transferred, the integrity isn't lost, and it's backed up, and things like that. So there's an awful lot of money in terms of building contracts, and then you have to hire more analysts to look at the data because you've got more data. Uh, so it's all uh, it's all an empire building process, and in the, and in the meantime they say they're doing it for terrorism, but they're not stopping terrorist attacks. So this is just a basic swindle, 
So we're all being swindled for money and building an empire building. It's, I call this the, the happiness management program for the military intelligence and industrial complex. So, you know, they're all, they're all very happy because they're getting rich. Unfortunately, that means that to keep it going that occasionally some of us have to die to keep it going. That's the problem. And that's really what's been happening all along. They've been failing every turn you look. And, you know, in a, as I'm just from a country, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like a country boy. So in the country, we would say, gee, if you keep failing, you must be doing something wrong. It's only common sense, right? So that would mean you'd have to stop and look and review everything you're doing to figure out what you're doing wrong to fix it so you can actually succeed. Well, they can't admit they're doing anything wrong. They can't face that. So they're like alcoholics. They can't correct themselves because they won't admit they've got a problem. And in the meantime, so they, I mean, because they're, their objective is to get a, build an empire and get more money. Well, that's working really well. And it's continually, continuing to work well. I mean, like, if you took, for example, in France, the first Paris attack, the, one, the first thing that came out of it, uh, that I heard anyway, was they needed another billion euros and another thousand analysts and more data. And then you had the second Paris attack. So what good did that do? The, so, you know, the point is, <clears throat> The entire intelligence uh, of all of the countries involved has, has shifted their focus to mass collection of data and not understanding the data that they've collected. So that's not a disciplined, focused, professional job, and that's really what's happening. They've lost that perspective. Their, <clears throat> their objective and their responsibility is to produce intelligence that tells you intentions and capabilities of targets so that they can preempt it and stop it and save people's lives, not let them die and then go clean up the mess afterward. That's a forensic job for the police. That's not intelligence at all. But in the United States, we paid over almost a trillion dollars <clears throat> since 9-11 on intelligence. What has that bought us? It's bought us a police state, a Gestapo, and a failed intelligence set of agencies that continually and consistently fail on stopping terrorism. That's what we bought for it. So I call it a swindle. Now they're doing the same thing with, uh, with cybersecurity. It's the same repeat, except it's a different topic that gives them another subject to get more money and build a greater empire. Why? <clears throat> because they, if you've noticed, recently they lost all of the, uh, so an insider took all of the uh, source code for their uh, tailored access office methods of penetrating firewalls, uh, operating systems, ser servers, uh, and switches, and networks. And he took that software out, now the shadow group has it, and they're trying to sell it, or something like that. Well, <clears throat> the point is, these are weaknesses in systems that they've known about for decades. From all the zero days, and all the other uh, built-in stuff is all a part of that. So it's all all the weaknesses in systems that they should have corrected if they wanted us to be cyber secure, right? But no, they wanted the windows open so they could see. So they left all of these weaknesses in all the systems. Well, they have no monopoly on smart people. So other governments and other people around the world can find these weaknesses too. So when they find them, you know, they penetrate also. So they, they, by doing that, they left us all vulnerable and weak and exposed. And so, but every time a hack comes along, they say, oh, cybersecurity is really important. We need more money for cybersecurity. But they don't fix the problems they already know. So this is another swindle. You know, so, any rate, uh, there is a, a way to do big data and do it right. And it, 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 it means you look at data in the sense of targeted, focused, disciplined approach. And you use it as a, you, you, you actually try to basically be professional. Okay, so this is an example. Um, <clears throat> in this case, we were looking at uh, IEDs. The, these are improvised, improvised explosive devices uh, that were. <clears throat> this was uh, from a factory that was uh, overrun in uh, Iraq, I think. Um, and so uh, these are the kinds of things they would build. They would take leftover artillery shells and turn them into IEDs, and then find and buy equipment and things to make it to uh, uh, make it possible to remotely detonate them. Then, when somebody was driving by, they would detonate them and they would uh, kill people or get hurt them. So, uh, <clears throat> so um, in uh, 2006, 
the Bureau of Industrial Security published this alert. This was from uh, uh, U.S. military overrunning a, an IED factory in Iraq. So they found the parts that were there and they found the, uh, the, the uh, uh, companies that had sold them. They, had, they went, traced and made sure that the, fact, the serial numbers matched to things that came out of those companies. And then they went to the companies and found it. These were the Iranian companies that were uh, purchasing the, the, uh, the parts to make the IED. Uh, but if you looked at any one of the companies, each one would only order one part. So normally what Customs and, and Border Protection, in, those who manage imports, exports, and, uh, and uh, manifests on ships and planes and so on for travel, uh, with what they normally look at is the company name and what that company is importing or exporting. So if you look at it that way, there's no IED produced here. Each company has a different part and you don't see the IED unless you aggregate all of them. Okay, so as each one's ordering different parts. And uh, so the way to aggregate is by the attributes that it, they attribute to them, like phone numbers or uh, postal box offices or addresses. And if you do that, then you can see that there's a collection of companies all in the same place doing something. What is that? Well, you have to aggregate what they're in, re importing or exporting, and you could see that they're building IEDs. And these were all Iranian companies located in Dubai, outside of Iran, sponsored by the Iranian government, of course, uh, <coughs> ordering all these parts for IEDs in Afghanistan and Iraq. So uh, we, we got this off Google and uh, the BIS report. So, um, <clears throat> so the, the, the point is that uh, you have to look at more than just a company name. You can't depend on that uh, for import and export and port security anywhere in the world. Uh, one of the things uh, is that, uh, and here were some of the locations they had, so you, you got these locations. Uh, so we, we then took the, the addresses and the names and went on the Google, used Google, and went on the web and got a whole bunch more data on it. We got all their phone numbers and uh, fax numbers and so on. And uh, <clears throat> then we passed all of this information to uh, Customs and Border Protection, uh, and also to uh, Colonel Woody's office in the Pentagon because they were managing the IEDs. And then since uh, Kirk Wiebe and I did this, and since we were so confident that our government was going to be um, incompetent at this, we passed this, all of this data up to the Canadians, who were also getting people killed by the IEDs, to ensure that they also had the data. So if they took action, you know, something would happen. If we couldn't depend on our government to do anything smart. So, because we knew them personally. <clears throat> but if you look at the last company down there, you see it's got some new phone numbers there in the 1400, 1500, and a partial number of a number from above. So this was the, what happened was, <clears throat> when, the, when the Bureau of Industrial Security first published the, the list of companies that were Im importing the parts to make the IEDs, the Iranians saw that, because the notice went out there worldwide, they saw that and they said, oh, we better change our names. So they changed their names, but in the process they didn't, they didn't, they were a little sloppy about it. This one company also included uh, for a short period before they took it off the web, they, that partial phone number and also the postal box office. Well, that gave us the key to follow them in the, the change. So we had the recovery of all of the phone numbers and addresses and names of the new companies that they were using. <clears throat> and then uh, after we had passed all of the additional information to the to uh, Customs and Border Protection in the Pentagon, this thought, gee, that's we better publish this new this additional information. So they did that like two months later, and then the Iranians saw that they were putting out the old data, and they said, hey, they're putting out the old data about us. We better put that old data back out there so they can watch that, and we'll operate on the new data. See, that's what's there. That's the, what they did. <laughs> Uh, our government didn't follow that, but we were watching it and told them all of it. This was happening, you know, so they had no idea. They were asleep at the wheel. But at any rate, uh, so uh, these were the other addresses that we picked up. And, and so eventually our government wised up, and two years later, uh, after we gave them all of this data in this form, and you'll get copies of this so you can look at it closer, um, two, days later, or two years later they issue this warrant for arrests. This is really swift. You know, 
the two years later, after they've had the data for two years, knowing all the data, they didn't really add anything. They added a little bit in terms of names and so on. But uh, so um, we, in turn, said, OK, this is a basic principle of how to look at data worldwide. So why don't we just take the entire data set of Customs and Border Protection, which is about a half billion records, uh, and, um, and uh, take it and do a collapse of all of all uh, uh, those company names internally in there uh, based on attributes, so that if multiple names of companies map to attributes, we would say there might be something you want to look at here. Uh, and at the same time, we would uh, set up a, uh, a scraping of the worldwide websites, pulling in all the data about companies worldwide, and also collapse that with uh, whatever uh, uh, yellow page data we could get from the world which would give all the addresses, names, and phone numbers, and so on, and attributes of the companies, plus their names, and so on. And then we'd collapse that all into one data set, and then fix, because Customs and Border Protection had a really messy database. I mean, <clears throat> because uh, the, the data that was submitted to them came from multiple, uh, all the countries in the world, basically importing and exporting the US, and also that was prepared by many different people in those countries who didn't, their main language wasn't English, so they would give different variations of names and make mistakes and things and typing addresses and so on. But all of that could be uh, corrected. Uh, <clears throat> see, they thought their, their, their data was a mess and that uh, the data is the data is what they told us. You can't fix it. We said, this is a gold mine. We have the opportunity to fix it. There's no N squared problem here. The more data doesn't mean more problems. It means you get greater chances to be able to fix the data. That is, you work the data against itself to fix it. And you do it, <clears throat> do it by things like frequency counts and matching repeated data. And you have to pick on reliable as uh, aspects of it to be able to do that. But uh, once you do that, all of that can be corrected. And that's what we propose to do for Customs and Border Protection in, for six months with the two programmers and Kirk Weeby and I. We'll fix that all for them in six months. Uh, <clears throat> and we estimated that based on our experience by scraping one website that had 5,032 Iranian companies in Dubai, uh, we, we did that scrape and found that there were 222 of those company names that mapped down to 55 different activities that they were doing in Dubai. They were doing it in Dubai because that's outside of Iran. There weren't the import-exports restrictions that w were in Iran, so they could do that in Dubai. But we ended up with 55 different activities that we said you guys need to look at because they're probably smuggling dope, uh, weapons, looking for nuclear devices and that were things that would help their nuclear program. Um, and of course, a couple of them were doing IEDs. So uh, those were all the uh, activities by the Iranian government out of Dubai. And this was an example of the kind of information you could get from doing this approach. Uh, <clears throat> and then again, that was a focused, disciplined job at looking at big data. Uh, look, knowing, first of all, having the question of what you want to answer and knowing what attributes in the data you could use to make decisions about that data and using the data to validate itself as a part of that process. Uh, <clears throat> so we proposed that, that we do that for them and we estimated that uh, we would only get uh, no more than 40,000 targets for their uh, inspectors at all the ports of entry in the U.S and around the world, of course, <clears throat> uh, that we have no more than 40,000 targets for them to look at. And they said, well, we only have two analysts here, so thank you, but no thank you. So they're not doing this. This is a really simple thing to do. They would add the port security around the world, and our governments aren't, aren't doing it. This is, this is insane, isn't it? This is a simple thing to do. It's not that hard. Well, this is the approach to big data, so we basically said, well, let's, uh, let's put together a, uh, a, a, a generic approach to big data analysis. Um, and you'll have all these slides. Some of them get a little complicated, and they're probably going to be hard to read from here. But uh, the whole idea is the first thing you have to do with big data is validate it. And you can do that within, its within itself. All those answers are in the data itself. The more data, the better, because the better chance you have of validating it. Um, if you know how to look at it and you, <clears throat> and you first know the questions you want to answer, know the, and then know the attributes that will allow you to make decisions about the data that will answer the, the uh, questions you're after. So those are the most important steps. Then once you do that, then 
validating the data is the first important step to take. No agency of, of the U.S. government or any other government that I know of does that. They simply accept the data as it is. And that is a big mistake because then you end up with a royal mess, right? And unless you fix it, you can't consolidate it. It's called normalization, if you will. In some cases, the uh, NSA calls it normalization. The whole idea is to get it, find the equivalences, and you'll find, you know, things like polymorphic mappings, isomorphic mappings, all meaning one-to-one, one-to-many, uh, one or many-to-many, -many, or many-to-one, those kinds of relationships. But those are like aliases, you know, and you can automatically reconstruct that with software. Um, and then once you correct the data, now you have a good base of information to work with. So, and then after validate, you have to recognize the events in that data that you're after, and then you build the graph of the activities. That means social networks, the kind of uh, relationships in phone networks or, uh, or whatever, financial transfers, whatever you're looking at. Um, and then from there, you recognize things that are important, and then you publish knowledge. You find what we call uh, profiles of interest in that and then use that to uh, generate knowledge and pass out uh, reports and so on. And then through the whole process, if there's anything that you, isn't fitting your knowledge, you drop it down to invalidated records and you have a separate set of programs running against that, looking at things vertically, horizontally, left to right, bottom to top, top to bottom, all kinds of ways of looking at the data to figure out if there's some consistency there that would help you sort it out and correct it and be able to put it back into the mainstream of knowledge. Um, and uh, you, of course, disseminate knowledge from that. And overall, you have to look at managing everything in the process. You, you need to know whether or not the functions are working uh, individually or uh, collectively they're failing at any given point, or if there's a problem at any given point, you need to have that as a part of the process. Plus, you need to be able to monitor anybody coming into your net. This is one of the big failures they have in NSA, as well as all the other agencies of the U.S. government and the British government, okay, <laughs> and others that I know of anyway. They don't have a monitoring process to monitor who's doing what across their network with their data or to their data. That is, if anybody's coming in to change the data or if they're coming in to... Uh, to select data, what data are they selecting, and is that agreeable with the laws and and all? And if you're collecting data and storing it, is that legal or is it illegal? You know, we don't do that now because most of it's illegal. <laughs> but uh, so they don't want to know. But again, the idea is you have an auditing process that allows you to know what's going on at every step of the way, and what anybody's coming into your network doing. This way, for example. If they'd have implemented this, this we had it operating in our system uh, thin thread, but that was one of the things they got rid of. Uh, in fact, uh, we had many protections in thin thread, like we wouldn't, we had a focused targeted approach on selecting data. So we had smart selection is smart collection. So we only pulled in, you know, 0.0001% of the data uh, that we could see the, because it was all that was relevant. The rest of it wasn't relevant, so we just let it go right by. So we didn't have to store it. So we could manage with a te standard telephone line, we could manage the collection of multiple fiber optic lines. So it wasn't a matter of, uh, we, un the unfortunate part is we were doing it too cheaply, you see. Uh, it didn't cost enough, so they they were, we weren't worth anything because we didn't add any value to the corporation, if you will. So, because <laughs> we didn't uh, support large money, large money flow toward them. But, so uh, they, they removed that, so. That was one of the things. Then we encrypted attributes of people until they could were, were proven to be parts of bad activities or criminal activities, um, conforming with the law and the Constitution and human rights. And so, uh, uh, but so we'd have to show and prove that to a court of law that that was they were a part of something. Then we'd have a warrant. Then we'd uncover them and target them. Um, and then in the end, we had this monitoring program that. Uh, that uh, would look at everything that was coming in and who came into the network, where they went, how long they stayed, what they did when they were there, and so on. And uh, none of that NSA liked, so they removed all of that and said, we're just going to take get, it, get the filter off the front end, remove the protections, and stop the monitoring, so that we once you look at everything, we'll just take it all in. And that's fundamentally what they did, and that's how they removed the parts of the program we did and used it to collect everything in the world. So, uh, that's how we ended up with mass surveillance. 
Um, and unfortunately, I had a part in making that possible. I tried to do it the right way and put the right things in so it would conform with laws and human rights and the Constitution. And uh, we had, uh, we had uh, what I uh, took to be uh, too, the, the forces of evil were just too numerous to overcome at NSA. And when uh, Dick Cheney said, we're going to the dark side, all rules were gone and the Constitution was scrapped. And so they did it all in secret, of course. Uh, because if you had an informed Congress and an informed public, they would oppose it from the very beginning. And they, so they kept it all secret until they could incrementally try to get laws passed to make it legal retroactively. They did things like giving the telecommunications companies uh, retroactive immunity in 2008 because they were being sued in, 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 uh, in, law, in courts of law, and that meant that it was a class action suit. So they could have paid billions of dollars to get that, act, that court case settled. So giving them retroactive immunity made, meant those cases went away. And that's what they try to protect them. So they're covering up for everybody's covering up for one another as a part of this process. It's just really criminal, that's all. Uh, so back to the subject here for, uh, as an example, just to internally invalidate data, uh, these are the kinds of things you have to do, the subsets of programs. I know pro probably you can't read them all, but You'll, you'll be able to see them on the slides that Arian will be able to give to you. Um, and uh, it, it just gives you a breakdown. Uh, this is in um, uh, DODAF format, meaning DOD architectural framework format, operational view level five. <laughs> this is a, actually, actually is a pretty good design. It's inputs come in from the left, uh, processes occur in the block. Uh, things that will enable it come down from the top and inhibitors like law and so on come up for the bottom uh, and then outputs from that process go from one to the other. So it's basically what to do and the dependency and the flow through the entire system. And each one of those major blocks on the other slide has a subset like this to show, <clears throat> to show how that uh, is broken down into sub-processes and how those, and each one is audited so that you know what each process is doing, how well it's working, and so on. And uh, this is our gener generic design to analyzing big data uh, for, of any kind, really. Um, and it simply goes through this, uh, the, you, you can see these slides uh, uh, for each of those major blocks in the previous slide. Those were the, that's like the high level. The previous slide is the high level uh, process relationship within the architectural framework. And, and this then is the breakdown internally in each of those blocks. And the whole idea is you can use this against any number of things like fraud of any type, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, refugees and their relationship within the countries they came from, or uh, just uh, any kind of uh, transactional relationship between banks, you know, uh, imports, exports, like the example we had, or you could uh, even go further with that. Um, and and uh, just any kind of fraudulent solicitations. I found mail order fraud using this kind of technique, you know, going back through the network, looking at data, trying to figure it out, and I reported this to the Postal Service. Uh, so that's, uh, that's basically uh, the, the, the idea of how to approach big data in the right way, looking for specific answers of things that are really relevant to criminal activity and, and not doing mass surveillance of everybody. If you want to control a population, mass surveillance is a good way to do it. Otherwise, if you want to succeed, a disciplined professional approach is the way to proceed. And so far, our countries aren't doing that. They're all adopting the mass surveillance approach because that costs a lot of money, that builds a big empire. And so I call that the happiness management program, you know. That means a lot of people get, a few, well, a few people get very rich and it makes a number of people very happy, but the rest of us pay for it. That's my story for tonight. <laughs> Just leave it. Thanks, Bill. Uh, we'll have a very short break. I just wanted to let everybody know the last slide you saw is one of our whole series. 
the whole series, plus all the other slides, plus various other documents, including all the tap points from various American telcos around the world, all that will be online at the Act 42 site. We'll publish the URL in one hour. Everybody can have a copy and have some fun. And if you want to do, uh, you know, a smart big data analytics tool to solve a real social problem and take the design and just run with it. There are some smart people here in the room who can do that. So uh, have some fun with that. We'll take a short break and then come back here and people can ask questions and Bill will answer that. Right, I have a question. I've seen footage of Linus Torvald being asked whether he was asked to put a backdoor into the Linux kernel. And I remember him answering no. <laughs> uh, well, uh, how would you interpret that? Uh, as questionable, I guess, at best. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I know they have a program called Bull Run where they put backdoors into crypt systems and they ask other companies to put in weaknesses. Uh, but they also know about a lot of zero day errors or flaws in the design of the software and implementation of it. So, uh, and also, uh, they also have found other kinds of, uh, uh, weaknesses in systems. So all of these were aggregate and they had the, that software was what was compromised here a few months ago by uh, uh, someone from the inside of the tailored access office at NSA, which is where they do design all the source code to do all the penetrations of these uh, different devices. These are the things that they've known about for years and years and haven't fixed, and that's why we've all been vulnerable for that period of time. Uh, the one hope, the ray of hope here is that now that they're, all of their software has been compromised, they might consider fixing the problems so that we might actually have some greater degree of uh, security in, uh, cyber, in the cyber world. Uh, so hopefully that'll happen. That might be one of the good things coming out of this. I, I thought it was short-sighted of them not to fix them from the beginning. Yeah. Short-sighted thinking because, you know, everybody's vulnerable because of that. It's not just, it's not just the, they, they, they claimed that they were only using it against governments. That was a lie. They, if you're using the system that they have a penetrating capacity to do it, you're penetrated. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for your talk. And the big question for me is, if I understand you correctly, we've already lost our privacy. And, yes. Uh, yeah. So the big question is, how do we get back our privacy? What do we need to do besides getting rid of all these uh, intelligence organizations? Uh, but are there some measures we as an individual can, uh, can take today, tomorrow, next week, to get back our own privacy? Yeah, uh, you have to take you have to attack them from multiple fronts. That that's what I'm trying to do in the United States is uh, attack them legally. I'm supporting four separate lawsuits against the United States government for unconstitutional violations of the privacy rights of U.S. citizens. Um, so, uh, and if uh, if we can get any one of those through to the Supreme Court and it's ruled unconstitutional, their entire house of cards will fall, and they'll have to stop this mass surveillance at least on the U.S. side. Uh, the other part about doing it against citizens of the world is that that makes them, their analysts totally dysfunctional. There's just too much data they can't get through and they can't find, uh, you know, any, any threat to us. So that, they, for that reason alone, they should stop mass surveillance. They should do a focused, disciplined, targeted job. And we've documented how to do that for them and given it to them. Uh, as well as uh, having done it because they had the same problem back in the 1990s. That's why we did the program we did to begin with, uh, was to, the analysts were getting buried by even the, you know, relatively minuscule amount of data they were had back then, but even then they were buried. And so uh, it was obvious to me when I became the, the technical director of the, the World Geopolitical and Military Analysis and Reporting Shop, which is about 6,000 analysts in NSA, I, uh, <clears throat> I used, I call that being the technical director of the world. I thought that was a good title, you know. <laughs> I had to laugh at that title anyway. But, uh, so, but uh, that was the major problem back then. And in now it's orders of magnitude worse because of what they're doing, the data they're collecting, which is, they call intelligence, but it isn't, you know. So uh, that, 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 uh, that is the major problem. But in order to do that, we have to attack them from the, because they're trying to legally, retroactively uh, make, make what they've been doing legal. 
But in the United States, that's still unconstitutional. So any law they pass to try to make something that's unconstitutional legal is not a law by, by when it gets tested for the Constitution. If it doesn't meet the Constitution, it's not a law. So uh, that means that <clears throat> if we get this constitutional challenge through, their whole house of cards falls. Everything they've done to try to legalize what the, the crimes they've been committing now fall. Um, and now they're exposed. Um, so that's one of the ways to do it. The other way is to, to you know, in the interim, you have to try to uh, 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 actually challenge your people running for office in political uh, office, parliament or whatever. What is your position on this and uh, why, if it's against your constitution or whatever, you have here in uh, Denmark and uh, uh, Netherlands to uh, deal with that. I, I've been in too many countries, okay. <laughs> in Germany, you know, they're violating their own constitution with a BND passing data on German citizens to NSA for storage and query. That's a violation of their constitution. So they should be challenged on that. So, so we are challenging the U.S. government for doing that also in terms of the U.S. So if you have something here that you can use, sue the bastards. Right? That's what I would say. My recommendation is sue them in any way you possibly can. If you can't get to the governments, the easiest way to do it then is to go against the, the companies that are part of the PRISM program. Because after all, they turn your data over too. And if, 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 if they're doing that, then that's a violation of your rights because the data that they have of yours is your data. And if they are supposed to ask you, I think according to European law here, they're supposed to ask you if they can uh, use it or give it to somebody else. And as far as I know, they didn't do that, <laughs> uh, which means they violated the law. So you can sue them, sue the companies, not the government. That's a little more difficult to sue the U.S. government. They might just say, go away, you know, but the companies, they have to do business here, right? And so you can sue them. That's one way to do it, too. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you have to get laws in place and actually hold people accountable to those laws. If they violate the laws, they should be tried against the law, by the law, in court. And that's what I'm trying to get happening in the U.S. One, one of the problems you're describing is if I want to, uh, to sue someone, I need to know what they've done. And um, it turns out we need a whistleblower somehow uh, to get the picture of what governments are actually doing. I so think I'm looking yeah. for what can I do as an individual uh, okay. today, <clears throat> tomorrow, to frustrate them. Uh, one of the things I'm, I can imagine is uh, tomorrow we all start generating vast amounts of data. So if they capture data, they can't build... Uh, their storage capacity fast enough to store to store it. Is that a way, or do we need encryption, or what's what's a feasible well, uh, way I mean, for us to do? Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of things you you could do in that sense. I would say uh, one of the easiest things you could do is use the Tor program. Uh, Tor, I think, is a way to help disguise who you're, where you're connecting in the network, uh, and that would add a layer of complexity to what they're they have to look at and what they do. They have different ways they try to cope with that, but more people using it would make it you know, a larger problem to deal with. So that would be one way. The other way, uh, you know, uh, change your encryption keys periodically. Um, keep things changing all the time. Um, uh, you, you could even, um, I, I'm in favor of inventing your own encryption program <laughs> because I think that's a, I, I like that, that's enjoyable things to do, so. Uh, but if you, uh, if you are not inclined to do that, you can shift around and use different encryption routines and from and get different keys, I think, if you possibly can, like every week or every other every other day or something like that, uh, you can do that. Or uh, um, I I I believe you could do things like uh, use simple transpositions in the data that would add kind of layers of complexity to it, like uh, exchange uh, characters, like every rotate every five characters, you know, from different one position one goes to four, two to three, you know, and so on. And you can just scramble the characters and then just use any encryption you have, and that's a layer of complexity. Uh, and if people did different things, that's all kinds of different things they have to figure out. <clears throat> more people doing different things, the more things are, are different, the, the more things they have to work on. And that usually takes people to do, first to recognize that something else is happening, then to recognize what it is, then to define programs to go against it. 
so <clears throat> that's another layer of work you're making for them, and it basically tapes up, takes up people time, and that's a complexity layer that they, that's the one area where they have a limited amount of resources. It's in the people. With the software, you know, software can handle any number of things, or they can run par any number of parallel processes and things like that. But, but people investigating to find out what's really going on, that's a limited amount of effort. You created quite a stir uh, with your uh, leaks, uh, with your whistleblowing. Uh, you, and, and annoyed probably quite a lot of uh, big parties. Uh, aren't you afraid? No. <laughs> no, actually, uh, <clears throat> I, I, wanted, I wanted to stir up everything to get into court of law, because if you get into the court of law, you can introduce uh, the evidence there. So, and since I'm doing everything out in the open in the public domain, it's not, they can't claim any of it's classified because it's out in the public domain. And it can be shown at any time to anybody, so they can't hide it, they'd have to deal with it in a court of law. That's when I get to talk to them about, about all the crimes they've been committing. That's exactly where I'd like to get the court involved. In your presentation, you had, on the one hand, uh, you told about uh, validating data, and uh, it's a brilliant idea, but you got a sorry but no sorry. <laughs> no, sorry but no from the higher ups. So, uh, they decided not to validate their data, and now they have a big bunch. But on the other hand, you had people trying to sue the NSA, and the NSA sneaking some laws through Congress so they wouldn't get sued. Why is there such a big disconnect between uh, what's happening in the NSA and the decisions being made? And how can we make people who are making the decisions take logical insight in what's going on? Uh, well, you see, the people making these decisions are a part of the problem. They're already in, in, it's like this incestuous relationship between corporations and government. You know, uh, like, for example, when uh, when they retire from their government jobs, they go to, you know, vice president over here or a board member over here or something of all these different companies. So uh, they get, uh, you know, uh, salaries on top of their retirement and something, things like that. So it's like that. If you set up all this money flow to companies, they in turn reward you with positions when you leave government, so you get more money and it benefits you. If you follow the careers of uh, the people at NSA who were there during 9-11, they're all now in uh, major positions in companies and corporations uh, looking back at the intelligence agencies uh, getting contracts. What you're saying is that there's not really a possibility of making people see sense or something because they're all... Uh, <clears throat> well, I claim there is with the Donald Trump as president <laughs> because I'm hoping he will come in and do exactly what he did on TV. You are fired, you know, just like that. Uh, he's looking for corruption. We will tell him where that is, okay? Uh, the NSA uses uh, red team under the disguise of blue team, so offense as a disguise for defense. Is there any way we can use defense as a disguise for offense against this? Uh, well, I, you know, I, uh, offhand, I, have, I haven't really thought of it, that, that, that problem, or how, maybe how you could do that, but... Uh, 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 I, I was always in favor of uh, defense being in a counterattack, and when I was in NSA, but nobody wanted to do that, okay? Because I felt if someone was coming in trying to get data, we should give it to them, plus a little extra, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so that we let the system route all this stuff right back to them so that the, then we could uh, kill their entire system at that point. So the, nobody wanted to buy into that. So for NSA, uh, that is counterattacking, because, you know, we would be open to the entire world, so anybody coming in trying to attack us would get counterattacked. So, uh, but I hadn't really thought about it from the, from the reverse side, about people being attacked by NSA. How could you... Uh, that you, you could maybe use the same kind of concept, but you, you know, it'd take a lot, you'd, you'd have to, I, I believe they do a, a scan for executable code coming in, so, um, you know, that might be difficult to get executable code through a barrier. Um, 
and you'd have to do something like that uh, to be counterattacking, so to speak. But I, I'm, uh, I've never really thought of it, and so I can't really give you a good answer there. Sorry. Hello. Uh, so you proposed a new way, uh, instead of mass surveillance, you just uh, target uh, the data. Uh, but to do a good targeting, you need a lot of data to train and, and to do stuff. So how do you know if you don't throw away too much data? And how do you want to collect the data? Yeah, um, there, there are th three logical approaches we used. One was deductive, uh, inductive, and then abductive approach of, of uh, finding things that were relevant to, to a terrorist or other criminal activity in the data uh, flow. Um, uh, the deductive way is to first you build the social networks and you see if, in a, if people are in close proximity in that social network to known bad guys of one, any sort. Uh, so what that meant from a known bad guy, you only go out no more than two hops. And in fact, when you're looking at data to try to validate that they're a part of it, you only look at uh, basically the first hop as originators. The other hop, you don't look at them as originators because that would take you out the next level, you see. So uh, the numbers of people you look at would go up exponentially as you move out. So, so <clears throat> the point is you only look at, you pull in all the data that has known bad guys attributes in either the send, uh, receive, or CC lines, or BCC lines, uh, then you pull that data in. If it, uh, otherwise you look for only data of people out at the first degree, or the first top, in the from line. Don't look at them in the to line because it could be from the next level out, you know. So you, uh, that's not relevant to the uh, to the known bad guys. So that kind of sets the set of subset of information that you pull in, and also defines that zone of suspicion, and it gives you the ability to show evidence of participation or not. And if that occurs, then then uh, this would be done by software, by the way. Once you do that, and it would automatically move all the that would, that it would now change that person into a known bad guy, and all the degrees would move out from there. And it's like a continuing pro algorithm that would keep running. And as you develop things, it would keep moving through the network. But uh, <clears throat> one of the ways I did this one time with one set of data uh, for uh, not for NSA, <laughs> but for another agency uh, until they got my contract canceled. Uh, and uh, the whole concept was pretty simple. If you have a large set of pe participants in a social network, and some of them are involved in some kind of criminal activity, it's really only a subset of it. You, so, you know, there's a bounded set of people in there that at any given time is only a finite size. So if you have a, an algorithm that you want to run against all of this data, this is the way I tested it, okay, uh, and you want to make sure that it's right uh, before you actually turn it on to implement, uh, then when you run it once, you should get an answer. Uh, here's all the extra bad guys. Uh, then if you run it again and you get more, that's, well, okay, is that right or wrong? Then you run it again, and if you get more, you have something wrong with your algorithm. Because your algorithm should get a result, period, and not go beyond that. It should approach a limit and stop. It shouldn't keep growing. If it's keeping growing, you've got a problem in your algorithm. So that was the way I tested it. So we uh, we did this on this one case, and... Uh, I didn't document it so they don't have it and they can't implement it. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> uh, we ran this program uh, like about eight times. And it never grew after the first run. That meant we had a good algorithm. So that was the, one of the ways of testing it. But again, uh, that's the idea of uh, a social network and its relationship. That was the deductive side. The inductive side <clears throat> was... Uh, if, uh, for example, you use a satellite phone in the mountains of Afghanistan or the jungles of Peru, you're probably either terrorist or dope, and we need to look at you. It's a zone of suspicion, basically. A, prob a behavioral property that says we should look at you. O or if you uh, look at uh, sites that are advocating jihad or violence against the West, or multiple of those sites are repeatedly looking, you might be in the process of becoming radicalized. You fall into the zone of suspicion. We need to look at you. <coughs> Or if you're, or if you're looking at uh, pedophilia sites or something like that, you're in that kind of criminal activity. Uh, so those kinds of things then are the inductive, where you don't have a direct connection to somebody who's known to be bad or uh, two degrees from them. 
uh, but you're looking at things that you shouldn't be or imply that you are leaning or inclined in a certain direction and so therefore you need to be looked at. Then the abductive sense is, uh, is uh, looking at uh, the relationships of things and the geographic, uh, how they fit in geography. Uh, for example, if your social network includes people who spread across all the countries that are involved in terrorism, we need to look at your community. Because we don't, if we don't know who you are, you may in fact be doing something related to terrorism, for example, or dope smuggling, the same kind of thing. It, depending on where your, your, your network is, uh, is distributed geographically, those kinds of things would be the way, uh, that would, uh, that, and in fact, it be, using the deductive and inductive approach, there is no case of a terrorist attack that couldn't have been, uh, uh targeted, uh, beforehand, uh, uh, from, from even before 9-11. So uh, those are the ways we would get it and how we would include things that they don't currently know and, and aren't doing very good at developing either. So this is the targeted approach. That means it's a much more effective way of doing the job and they're not doing that. So, But to test the algorithms, you, you need the data, right? Uh, you need to be able to look at the data, not necessarily capture it. That's what we did. We just sessionized it to the point where you could look at it. Is this in the zone or not? If it is, take it in. If it isn't, let it go by. Okay. So uh, that's what they should be doing. That would mean that none of the data on people, 99.999% uh, uh, of the people would be in their database. But of course, they wouldn't have to build all these big databases either. That's, you know, that takes away our money, you know? Yeah. So, uh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. I would like to ask you, uh, how important are social media like Twitter and Facebook in collecting intelligence? Uh, actually, I can answer that with the FBI perspective. They look at it as a gold mine for them. It's one of the best sources of information they have because a lot of times the people go in there and brag about the crimes they committed. And when they do, that's direct evidence <laughs> of, of participants and they go arrest them and they use, them in a, they use that in a court of law too, so. Okay. okay. So it's really an important uh, asset for them, for the FBI, and it certainly is for NSA too. Because then if anybody's talking about any criminal activity uh, internationally or whatever, they, they can use that to, to leverage them, look into the networks that they've already reconstructed, summarize it with all the all information I've already collected and, and build on that. Yeah, so it's, it's important for them. You talked about that uh, uh, NSA has about 80 different um, communication providers that they work with. Is it uh, with that kind of coverage? Is it still possible to have your own private network? Uh, you can uh, you could try to do that, but they <laughs> they also they also focus on penetrating private networks too. So any VPN around the world, they, they uh, again, that was probably compromised in all of the t tra uh, tailored access office uh, source code that was uh, uh, compromised here. They had terabytes of data, uh, source code, so there's a lot of it there, and I'm sure a lot of it had to how do you penetrate their different uh, virtual private networks. So, and they do target those, by the way. That, that private data, uh, do they have safeguards so it doesn't end up in the wrong places? Uh, no. no. Not that I know of, okay. They weren't doing anything smart when I was there. I don't think they're doing anything smart now, so. So what kind of firewalls do, do, do they have? <laughs> uh, they actually uh, have a, <clears throat> what they, what they uh, do is have a totally uh, worldwide closed network. So, and it's bulk encrypted, so. That means if you tap into the lines anywhere in the world uh, between major uh, points in NSA and overseas, uh, you get a bulk encrypted line. So <clears throat> in order to see what it is that there's, that's going along that line, you have to know the bulk encryption. So you have to reverse engineer the bulk encryption to be, a, and you have to keep up with it as you, and where you tap in, where are you in that encryption? So you have to try to catch that and follow it, you know, as it's happening, that's you know, going to be, and then if you wanted to insert something, that would be difficult because you'd have to insert it in the blank spaces, you know. <laughs> so because if it came along with other data encrypted, it would get messed up even further. So 
uh, it, that would be a hard line to sink into anyway, I even if you tapped it. And that kind of lines, would the NSA be able to tap and de de um, decrypt them? Uh, if they know the bulk encryption algorithm, yeah. Uh, good encryption, if you know the log uh, logarithm, you still need the key, right? Uh, <clears throat> that, unless they did uh, a weakness uh, in, in the Bull Run program, which is where they worked with companies that built the encryption systems to build weaknesses in the encryption so that they could read it. Yeah. So, uh, according to, uh, amongst others, that Snowden, who said encryption does work. I mean, it's at least some other systems, if you use yeah. it right. So we have some things like Tails and some other bits um, that, that do seem to work, which is why WikiLeaks still operates and stuff. So if we wanted to make a secure device that maybe is not secure against the highest possible attacks, but has, you know, orders of magnitude better than most of the crap we have now, how, how big, because you did ThinThread with a very small team on a, very limited, you know, very modest budget compared to almost everything else. So how, with how small a team could you put something together based on stuff that's already out there that we know we can trust or reasonably trust? You mean, that, a, that is secure. You mean an encryption to, to build encryption for protection of what you're saying in, yeah. in the network? Yeah, so, so, that, uh, so that you can exchange messages, whether it's email or something else, um, well, with, I, with I, a high degree of certainty that that's not readable. Well, I, I would think you could do that with one or two people. And, and, but so they would be crypto math people and, and yeah, and uh, well, some uh, like a some someone in, in, in knowledgeable in mathematics and probabilities and uh, things like that mm -hmm. and design, and then uh, a coder, yeah, or right. two. And um, uh, mm -hmm. and how about the hardware side of things? Because we know that most of the current hardware is pretty much broken. Well, I, <clears throat> if you, uh, this is where it comes into the physical security of what's going on. That's where you have to isolate whatever you're doing and make sure it's in a Faraday cage, mm -hmm. so that uh, you know you you don't get rate. It doesn't get radio. It can't be tapped in the radiation. Um, and so, uh, if you do that, and you have that air gap. Uh, then you do everything on uh, reformatted, uh, you know, <clears throat> storage, like in a in a thumb drive or something. Yep. Uh, so you kind of wipe everything out on it and then do the encryption separately under, in, within the Faraday cage and then take it out and then go somewhere and then uh, send it. And then on the other end, you have to have the reverse. So you have to have the reverse situation where you have to take it off that network and go through, through go back into a Faraday area, a uh, Faraday caged area where you insert it into another computer that's protected and do the decrypts there. Um, that would be a way of doing it uh, physically, so that could that could make that secure in that way. But again, I would suggest also for a closed network that if you're if you're uh, if you want to keep this within a small space, you can put a fairly easy put a, a closed network in and make that happen, or extend it as you need it. Uh, but uh, the idea is closed networks and uh, isolated, uh, ga air gapped, uh, Faraday caged encryption and decryption. Uh, to protect the information, as if you really want to do it, uh, that's that's fundamentally the way basically NSA does it. Their building, whole building, is encrypted, is is covered in a uh, copper mesh, making the entire building a Faraday cage. So that's the way they do it too. How do you think that a initiative like bi for Purdue would help to unfuck this situation? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't hear that. <laughs> you did. <laughs> I'm going to make you repeat that. Let's see if I care. <laughs> How could an initiative like the bi for Purdue help to unfuck this situation? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, well. Uh, to me, it, it would be the ways of, a, of experimenting with different things and designing. Uh, sort. I mean, you should set up your own attack defense network too, if you want. That you could do that too and try that to help figure out weaknesses in systems and, uh, and, and but also to uh, perhaps even uh, look at testing different ways of attacking uh, computer uh, or encryption systems too. You can you could set that up if you have people who are interested in doing that. So. I mean, there are ways that you could use it to test all kinds of uh, 
theories or, or things that you might want to try to do to, to add protection to the network. I mean, that's, that's the way I would think you would use this beehive, you know. Use the creative, innovative uh, uh, juices of the people involved to, to try things. Yeah. A lot of shouts here in Europe uh, go up that say uh, whatever the NSA does, uh, whatever the United States does, at least the least they can do is stop freaking spying on their own allies. Do you think that's even physically possible to do with the current setup and hardware, spy hardware, shouting wildly everything they know uh, across the street, uh, across the sea to America? Uh, well, like apart from all the corruption, etc. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you could do that if you went to a targeted approach. With the bulk approach, no. Uh, with the bulk collection data, um, <clears throat> everybody's going to be taken in. So even U.S. senators and representatives, and they're all taken in too. But uh, with a targeted approach, you could do that. Yeah, you could actually limit. Uh, uh, but in fact, uh, historically, uh, allies have spied on each other for centuries. <laughs> so. <laughs> but but it's so so what you're saying is that it's not possible with with bulk uh, information gathering to separate some countries or some parts of the world and well, not it, collect data. It, it is possible, but you have to do targeting within the bulk acquisition. Uh, see, uh, if if uh, like I'll use the case in uh, the uh, lawyers for GCHQ and GCHQ were telling the British Parliament that uh, they couldn't identify the communications of the members of parliament in the bulk system that they were using and the collecting in this bulk acquisition. So we can't really tell, you know, that uh, what, it, what communication belongs to you. Um, and that was simply false, okay? I called it horseshit. And uh, Duncan Campbell, who's a reporter over there, published that as horseshit. Yeah, but, but then <laughs> so. you already have collected the data before telling me that it's mine and you'll delete it. Well, if they if they did this selection, but in bulk acquisition they don't see that. What I'm what I'm saying is you need if you if you use that data, the attributes of the uh, parliament members to recognize their communications in the bulk flow, you could separate that out and filter it out. So what I was saying basically is that what they were telling their parliament members was false, and in fact, commercial equipment can do that uh, various. Uh, uh, Naris and variant devices could do that as early as 2002. So, I mean, it's commercially available equipment that they can use to make that happen. Uh, but they didn't want them to, to believe that that was possible so that they could take in their communications. Thank you. It's just another way of deceiving people, misinforming them, and, and uh, duping them, basically, into believing what they want them to believe. With all this information that's collected, um, how big is the chance that it gets used for political purposes? Uh, well, it, I mean, uh, the current uh, process is they do use it for political purposes, right? They use it against the Tea Party in the U.S. They use it against the uh, Occupy group. <clears throat> they use it against people who are trying to put their bankers in uh, in jail. They've used it against reporters, Jim Risen, Jim Rosen, various other people, and the Associated Press, other uh, investigative reporters, uh, their sources, they've used it against them, so their sources are drying up. No one will talk to them, uh, so uh, <clears throat> they use it uh, for many purposes, yeah. Uh, when we um, go onto stuff like a VPN, proxy, Tor network, we get red flagged by whatever people are spying on us, be it NSA, MI5, CIA, whatever. Um, if we use it for legitimate uh, anonymity for everyday use, um, we get a red flag. If they then trace that red flag because you know yada yada other person who has used it for illegal trafficking, and they take you in. Constitutionally, you're allowed to say, I'm not giving you the data because privacy. But they will force you to give up that information via other means. 
um, is there a way we can protect ourselves through a police state that is the police? Well, in, in that case, I mean, you, you, the only thing you have are the rights that you have under the law. Yeah. And that's what you have to argue, I guess. Yeah, but seeing as the police will <clears throat> assert their power over you because of threatening with jail time, threatening with non-cooperation with a police investigation, can't do much. Is there, next to a lawyer, anything you can do? Well, I mean, uh, in, in each country, I guess you'd, I, I, I wouldn't, don't know the laws in each country, but in my country, I would say, uh, go to hell, I've got my constitutional rights, and you, you can just go piss up a rope, yeah. you know? <laughs> that's what I would say. But that's what I can say in the U.S. I don't know what you could say here. <clears throat> of course, but I was speaking in general. My other question is, uh, there is now lots of money going into breaking the Tor network. Yeah. Uh, we had Sammy uh, launch his EverCookie, a cookie you cannot delete that's once on the computer you can go to Tor and it's like, well, it's going through this node and that node and that node and that node. Um, <laughs> are you... Uh, do you object against stuff like that? That's one thing could work uh, securely against the terrorists who do use an uh, anonymity against that it could also be used for public. Yeah, you see, that's part of the reason they're failing. They're going at people who are totally innocent of anything and, and looking and trying to figure out what they're doing. That's that's part of the reason they're failing. This is why this bulk and mass approach is an outright failure for the objective of stopping terrorist attacks or criminal activity because it, it, it's forcing them to go look at people who are doing this and using it legitimately for uh, legal reasons. They have their reason not to... They want to be private. So, so uh, I mean, you know... I. I I would say uh, I would still use the Tor now. More people using the Tor now, I think, the better. So uh, that's the way I would say it, you know. Yeah. A little less technical question. You were talking about um, the swindle, mass surveillance, and how it, it came alive, and uh, that you, they use it uh, against uh, to protect us from terrorist attacks. But you said... None of them have been prevented, but we read in the newspapers they are prevented. There, how would you explain that? Uh, which ones are you talking about? The recent ones? We we were reading yeah. newspapers uh, in, in in our country. Yeah, what it was is yeah. I, I think uh, what you're referring to is recently. I think they started using the data to go at people. That is after the Brussels attacks and the Paris attacks. I think they started to use that data. That, that in other words, it looked like to me. Uh, some of the countries here were starting to focus. That's a good thing. That's what they should do universally. You know, they should have been doing that all along, and they would have, <clears throat> I mean, they would have focused in on the people who actually, pre, you know, per, uh, uh, process, uh, actually pre, uh, executed these attacks. So you would say that's a start? That's a start, yeah. 